I've been away from the channel for a while, and I'm sorry about that. Some of you have voiced your concerns, and my friend Jeff from the Virtual Guy channel even went so far as to send me a support package. So I guess it's time to light the fires again. Alright, let's see what he sent us. Jeff has sent me this mystery bar of metal, which he says is silver. While Jeff is my friend and I trust him, let's for the sake of the science assume that Bark is short for villainous ominous guy, and that he's trying to ruin me by sending me fake silver. What can we as gold and silversmiths do to determine if it's really silver? We can examine some of the physical, chemical and thermal properties of the metal with just the items that we normally have in our workshop. We can try sliding a magnet over the silver, or the silver over a magnet. Silver is diamagnetic, which means it will generate an opposing magnetic field when you approach it with a magnet. What we see here is the slide of the magnet being slowed down by the field. The same will happen if you slide a magnet over a copper or lead plate, as they are also diamagnetic. Aluminum, on the other hand, is not and will not slow the slide. Another indicator test we can do is the ice test. Silver has the highest thermal conductivity of all the metals, with 429 watts per meter kelvin. So it will melt ice much faster than, for example, stainless steel, which has something like 23 watts per meter kelvin. But copper is almost as conductive as silver. A silver-plated copper item would melt ice almost as fast as silver. As a little bonus info, I can tell you that diamonds has a thermal conductivity of more than 2000. So the ice test can also be used for diamonds. Having tried some easy indicator tests, let's do something with a hammer. What if the ingot is just coated with silver? Let's hack a piece off and see if there's something else inside. No, it's a solid and silver colored inside which means that we can eliminate the materials that are not silver colored. So, with all the home tests out of the way, let's science things up a bit. What? Too much? We can try pickling the sample in sulfuric acid. This will rule out iron contamination and zinc, nickel, aluminum and copper alloys, which will dissolve while giving off bubbles or exposing pink copper. If copper is deposited on other items in the acid, the sample contains iron. In this case, our sample turns white, as would be expected for silver. It's always a good idea to test for nickel in silver you want to use for jewelry. But the nickel test will also indicate if you have nickel silver, or sometimes called German silver, an alloy of typically 60% copper, 20% nickel and 20% zinc. So it has nothing to do with silver. Cutlery marked with EP and S is electropated nickel silver and only has a thin surface layer of silver. The nickel test will show red if nickel is present on the surface, so test on a file or sanded area. If we try to melt the silver sample and cast an ingot, we can rule out metals with very high melting points, as a normal propane torch and crucible setup only will go to copper's melting point of 1084 degrees with some effort. The sample melts within the time I expect sterling silver to melt, so that is a good indication. Sterling silver can be rolled down to about half size without cracking, and this sample behaves just like that. There's only a small flaw after rolling, and I can attribute that to the casting. To get a more specific indication of the melting point, we can test a sample with a reference. If the sample melts after hard solder and before pure silver, it's not contaminated with things like lead, which will lower the melting point significantly. Here the solder melts first, then my sample. My reference sterling silver may have not been clean enough to flow but it's molden and the fine silver did not melt. 
that puts our sample in the 770 to 961 range, which is just what we want. A non-destructive test is to measure the specific density of the metal sample compared to a standard, which is the 1000 kg per cube meter of water. Pythagoras found out that an object submerged in a liquid will displace a volume equal to its own and lose weight equal to the weight of the liquid displaced. As an object is submerged, the water will assert a buoyancy force on the object equal to the weight of the water it displaces. I did the test on the bullion but ended up with a number of 10.01, which is a bit low compared to the expected 10.35 of sterling silver. But Jeff has been complaining about porosities, so perhaps air is caught in the metal. I redid the experiment on the ingot I cast and rolled. The ingot I cast weighs in at 22.6 grams, and in water it loses 2.2 grams. So its weight compared to its weight in water is 22.6 divided by 2.2, which is 10.27, which is a lot closer to the 10.35 and as close to tolerances as my scale allows. So, would it be possible to make an alloy out of, for example, copper and lead that has the same density as silver? Yes, but the color would be different and it wouldn't have the silver ring to it. More likely a dull thought of lead, and the acid test would show no silver content. There is a way to prove that the sample actually contains silver. That is to use silver testing acid like potassium dichromate, which will turn brown for coin silver and red for fine or sterling silver. The test set comes with a color chart for other color indications. The dichromate and bichromate acids can cause cancer, so be careful with handling them. All right. So, by process of elimination, I conclude that what Jeff sent me is actually sterling silver. That means he's not the villainous omnius guy, uh, but in fact a kind British gentleman. So, what do you think I should send him in return for his kind gift? Let me know in the comments below. I'm Oliver Christensen. Thanks for watching.